Hello. hello, hello. It's Alexandra Maloney. I am a BPI board member and I am also the host of BPIA Chats. I hope everyone is staying safe and lifted during this time. Our BPIA uh, Chat series hopes to share the experiences and insights of members of the international affairs community and hopefully inspire the next generation uh, to explore opportunities in the field. The thoughts and views of our guest speakers are their own and do not reflect the views of BPIA. And we are currently streaming live and this talk will be posted on our IGTV and our YouTube channel afterwards. So if you haven't already followed Black Professionals in International Affairs, uh, then please follow us on Instagram at IABPIA, um, as well as our guest speaker, Chinedu, where you can find his um, handle on the flyer on our page. And lastly, we encourage viewers to chime in below in the thread uh, with any comments and questions that they may have. So without further ado, I will introduce our guest speaker for today. Chinedu Nuwafor is an international education activist and graduate student at Morgan State University, where he is receiving his MS in project management. His expertise is in international relations, HBCU equity, as well as community organizing. He was a Forbes Under 30 scholar and a fellow with the, at the 2017 U.S.-China Pengyo Leadership Conference at Harvard University. He prides himself on not only being a teacher, but a student as well. Thank you so much, Chinedu, for joining us today. Thank you all so much for having me. So I'll start off by asking, um, how is the COVID-19, where, I know you're based in Baltimore, but where you're based, how is it affecting uh, life and work and things where you are? Well, first, today is a very interesting day beyond I'm going to I'm gonna mix it into COVID-19. So today, five years ago, was the uh, infamous day where the Baltimore uprisings took place, where right. myself and the other Morgan State students were down in the heart of West Baltimore off of North Avenue trying to make sure students were getting home during that time because um, the buses were closed down, as well as trying to keep the city and the people intact. So it's been a lot of reflection on today's date. And then to be here five years later, in this COVID-19, it's just uh, it's an interesting place to be in a, not only in America, but in the world, you know, I'm working from home I'm here at the home office, thank God for a home office. Um, but, you know, I've been trying to keep together, you know, a lot of people are talking about stay healthy as in stay inside. A lot of people are talking about, you know, the economy that's gonna suffer. But my most and my biggest concern is about the mental health of people. A lot of people who are um, extroverts, this is hard for them um, being in the house, um, being sequestered into a small space, being sequestered with their thoughts, or you know, not being able to you know, commiserate with their colleagues. So during this time, I try my best to keep positive, uh, keep happy, keep healthy, I'm working out. And yes, when I go to the grocery store, I treat it like it's the club. I make sure I say hi to people. <laughs> so, so I get that person to person interaction. Cool. So tell us a little bit more about what got you where you are now. So, you know, academic, professional life journey. Um, to be honest, first of all, shout out to all of my friends who are supporting me. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> and, the whole time and follow BPIA. Um, that's a very good question. Um, what really got me to where I am is a concept of putting destiny before decision. So in this life, we have these ideas that, you know, I want to be a this and I want to be a that and, and I'm going to be a this and I'm going to be a that. But um, because I, you know, believe in a higher power, you have to ask yourself, God, is this what I want to be? Because I'm a servant of you. How can I serve you and your people best? How can I be of service to thine will? Not my own, a higher will, because I believe that we are all, you know, interconnected. And we're not here just for ourselves. We're here for the greater good of all mankind. So when I started le leaning into my destiny, it literally came through activism back in 2012. The first, the first thing that changed my life is, and it's, it's interesting because I have a background in um, community organizing, it was the death of Trayvon Martin. That death really shook a lot of my colleagues were freshly in college and we didn't understand what was going on and how these things were happening. And you know, nobody was, 
we felt like nobody was answering our questions properly and we needed to prepare. And, you know, we had a rally, over 500 students. And in that moment, um, I started to put more of a focus on not only community organizing, but international affairs. Like all these things started to come one after the other. And that's only when I started to move in my destiny and stay far away from my own personal decisions. Because once I moved in my destiny, everything presented itself to me. So that is the process that got me to where I am today. <laughs> and how are you connected to the international arena? So I know you've been a part of a number of fellowships and program uh, Project Pongyo at Harvard University, Forbes 30 Under 30 Scholars Program. Uh, could you share a little bit more about your international uh, experiences? <laughs> Thank you for asking. Well, first of all, being at the number one HBCU in the country, as well as the number one HBCU that has granted the most Fulbrights, and we're at 115 now, Morgan State University. Had to put that stat out there. Um, my institution has been very uh, huge on promoting international relations. The Division of International Affairs at my institution has been very steadfast in promoting events. Um, when I was at Morgan as a, a junior at the time, I was um, involved in the International Students Association. I actually represented them as the Mr. International Students Association. So I was getting very, very involved, but it was just dibbling and dabbling. I wasn't getting too deep into it. But it wasn't until a colleague of mine who was teaching English in um, Tangshan, China, invited me to come visit. So I went to China, I think this was about 2015, possibly. 15, yes. I went there in November to visit, and it's my first time in China, and I fell in love. It was a beautiful place, and I got along with the people. And what I realized is, even though I didn't speak any Chinese, the international language of love and understanding served me very well. So from that one experience, I started to get more interested in China-US relations. So when I graduated from college in 2017, um, I was informed by a colleague of mine about the Project Pengyo, uh, the China-U.S. Relationship Conference at um, Harvard. So I applied, and I guess the rest that they say is history. <laughs> awesome. So around the topic of international education and HBCUs, so um, in your opinion, what are HBCUs doing well in terms of international education? And what are things that HBCUs can be doing more of to continue to give these opportunities to uh, HBCU students? So I'll be honest. What HBCUs are doing absolutely well is that they are getting very interested in the, the globalization effort. So um, many, uh, when China came and China started granting a lot of grants, this is back during when Obama was in office, and this continued afterwards, when they were granting a lot of grants for students to come, the HBCUs were taking those grants on. I think that was a good thing. They were starting that exchange. I think that's good. But I think, in my opinion, some of the biggest problems is, as a historically black college university, I personally believe that the emphasis should be put more on black nations, because I find it interesting that you know, a, a person, an African that interconnectedness. So that's something that I would uh, think that the HBCUs should focus a little bit more on um, putting a lot of emphasis
is a lot of resources. In <clears throat> What are ways that everyday individuals um, share their opportunities as well as I'll give an example of what me and colleagues do go to at least one or two or if you see it on, on you know experience and people to be in form from your own groups and go go to places you know we went to Cuba Ireland we buy United Arab Emirates and we're at This year, sometimes about pro statistics. Everybody, it's up to look into yourself to say, hmm, how understanding form groups, form forums. I mean, look what we're doing right now. We're doing this chat during the COVID. <laughs> These are little things domestically, house party or gathering when we sit together during our in to see how everybody, you know, thinks about it. But if you're in the educational sphere, I think it's very important to see your vice president of international affairs and say, how can I help? At Morgan State, we have the legendary uh, Dr. Yakub Astaki. He is incredible. And he his agenda is everything for students. He will continue to tell you, tell you that. He will go to the president and say, everything for students. <laughs> but have to be, students have to be willing to come express their ideas. So it always starts with you, that's what I would say. With Chinedi Nua, who is a international education activist and, and community mobilizer um, out of Morgan State University in Baltimore, Maryland. Please feel free to comment and add your questions below uh, in regards to international education, study abroad, um, uh, opportunities as well as uh, community mobilizing and leadership, things of that nature. So the next question that I wanted to ask, um, Chinedia, you have a ex expertise in mobilizing communities for positive change. So where has that stemmed from um, and what advice do you have for other individuals who may, um, you know, want to also develop those skill sets for themselves? Oh, wow. Um, and touching back, first of all, thank you for that question. Um, touching back on what I told you about um, the death of uh, Mr. Trayvon Martin, I've always known, so let's, let's go back a little bit further, because I follow a lot of African tradition, and one famous African uh, adage is to know where you're going, know where you came from. Yeah. My great-grandfather is an expert orator. And so was my grandfather, and so was my father. So biologically speaking, it was only a matter of time before one of my dad's kids ended up showing those traits. And we all have it in our house, but I think I have like, I have the deep passion in public speaking and public organizing, but it runs in my blood. So I like to say it was nothing I was taught. It's something mm -hmm. that's brain, And that goes back to that destiny thing. It's just what I was destined to do. So when I got uh, started with Trayvon Martin, that just, I started to look for more issues involving the HBCUs, more issues involving the community. And I started to run and literally run towards certain issues that I felt like I could help that meant something. There was no lesson. It was we were learning as we go. Uh, and, and figure out, okay, who's gonna teach this person? We were literally there. The first rally we did was Trayvon Martin, and literally the week after that, the week after, we assembled a thousand students 
from before HBCUs mm -hmm. to convert from Lawyers Mall in Annapolis for HBCU equity. This was in 2012. We were young kids, 19, 18, 20. We didn't have an idea of the depth of what it is to gather for social activism, but we know that we were standing on the shoulders of our ancestors. So a lot of this comes from believing in yourself. Um, once you believe in yourself and actually put real effort, I'm not talking about the, 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 Twitter, the Twitter activists. You have to actually try and do something. And no one's saying do it perfectly. Even Martin Luther King made mistakes, but you have to actually do something to get something done. Mm. So you recently, you mentioned it um, briefly, but you recently testified at the Maryland State Capitol for the uh, HBCU equity case that has been ongoing for what, over like 10 years, 20 years span yeah. of time. Can you share a little bit more about that? Because sometimes there may be a disconnect um, for the bigger picture of how the domestic politics and state level ultimately affect funding, which affects programs and international expansion and opportunities for mm. these institutions. Um, and being a person who comes from an international background and family who was directly impacted by HBCUs. Can you just share a little bit more about that case and your involvement and the recent results of the case? Oh, absolutely. Um, I have wrecked Morgan, but I'm getting hot, so I gotta take this off. <laughs> and now to my next my next marketing plug. Shout out, <laughs> shout out to Forbes 30 under 30, especially for the culture. That's why I'm rocking their shirts. The Black Coalition at the Forbes 30 under 30 conference. Always gotta represent them. Um, I thank you for that question because <clears throat> interestingly enough, this HBCU equality equity case has been going on since about early 2006. And the issue was that a couple of graduates and professionals alike from the HBCUs realized that there was a, a gross underfunding of the historically black colleges and universities. Um, so they galvanized together and formed the Coalition for Equity and Excellence to address the state and sue the state um, for inequitably funding the school. Now, at first it was just a thought, hmm, maybe they're not being equitable, but once they did their research and got further and further in, the inequities were insurmountable. Like, it was ridiculous. Um, they had one of the greatest law firms in the country, Kirkland and Ellis, uh, helping them with this case pro bono. That was the mm -hmm. most important part for me. Pro bono, let's do the math. This case just, quote unquote, ended this year, started 2005, that's 15 years. Mm -hmm. That's hundreds of lawyers from across the country flying into D.C., flying to other, flying to Tennessee uh, to look up some of the cases that they had just to solve this problem for us. So the students were really involved. My involvement with that started back in, again, 2012. And our point was to make the state understand that we as students, we're involved in this and we know what you did. Um, myself and some colleagues, we had some sworn affidavits back in 2013 and we testified uh, via those documents. But what really got us pumped is the state argued and said that they weren't aware that students actually cared about this case. Hmm. And that's when we had to show our beautiful state that our intelligentsia that we are uh, picking up at the HBCUs, uh, are, you, they cannot be compromised. So again, we had to lay it out for them. We had to let them know that you all broke your own law and illegally duplicated programs. So you can't go to us. So let's, let's break it down into small pieces. Let's say Morgan State gets funded $10, okay, a year. Let's just say that, right? You can't take a program from our school, duplicate it at a school within a specific mile radius, which is a Maryland state law, and then give that school $150 a year. You are actually mm -hmm. taking from one and giving to other. And they're both state schools. So robbing Peter to pay for Paul is absolutely um, uh, uncalled for. So students stood for that. We marched, we rallied, we filled up the courthouses. We wanted to make them, we wanted to let the state know that we care because you all think that students don't care about this. We, we, we've done so many educational things. We were even flown, uh, my crew were flown in 2013 to 
uh, Tennessee. Well, it was supposed to be a flight, but money was tight. So we drove, which was very interesting. And we drove to Tennessee. And we actually, again, look at us young kids. We actually were training professionals at Tennessee State University. I'm talking about PhD holders. I'm talking about researchers. who we were training them on student activists. And I wasn't even 21 at the time. You know, it was a brave moment for black excellence throughout the world of the HBCU. And bringing us to this uh, past um, session, the Maryland General uh, Assembly, not only were there two bills, a House bill and a Senate bill, I was able to testify, my tribe was able to testify, the elders were able to testify, and the youth were able to testify. And both bills passed the House and the Senate with flying colors. So with the almost nine years of the work that I've put in with my team, as well as the 15 years of the coalition, all that came to fruition, but it only worked because we as students made it our business to represent our institution following in the history of HBCUs. Thank you for sharing that, Chinedu, because as one of your fans, I've been watching from a distance for many a year. <laughs> Um, and I'm very inspired by the work that you all are doing that may not even affect you or students that you know personally, but will be affecting um, and benefiting students much later down the line, like future generations of students, of HBCU students. Um, so I'm really appreciative of the work that you've done and contributed to the field. Um, and clearly it's gotten you some recognition you know, you have gotten a, a distinction as a Forbes 30 Under 30 Scholar. So maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that experience for you and what the conference was like um, and and more information around that. So the, the conference, the Forbes 30 Under 30, the uh, first year I went, because I was selected twice. First year I went, it, it was just an honor because one, the first time I was back in Boston, I'm like, I hadn't been in Boston in two years since the Harvard conference. And... For me as a black man, it was just an honor to just look at myself and say, look at you, you know, you're the son of a man, Dr. Cosmos Bokafor, a man who, who grew up in a very poor village, whose parents were very poor, but who dreamed, who dreamed for a better future, got accepted and looked at by the HBCU Howard University and made it to the Americas. So every time I'm accepted into a, a different group, I look back at the lineage. I look back at how, for me, HBCU runs my life, like how the HBCU has been, without the HBCUs, my family wouldn't even have a history in these Americas. They mm. changed the trajectory of my entire lineage. That's a big deal. So when I got accepted into Forbes 30 and the 30, I was a little nervous, but I came, you know, in my full African regalia ready to show them what Morgan State University, as well as all of the HBCUs have to offer. Um, the finest in ideas, innovation, intelligentsia, all of that. So upon attending the conference, it was cool to meet up with other Black colleagues and um, discuss on how we want to shape our future and how we want to make things easier for the generation coming after us. Um, I was able to, one of my major highlights was attending the um, J.P. Morgan um, Hackathon and I mean, talk about intimidation. You got Boston College in there with a team. You got MIT in there with a team. You got one of these technical engineering high schools in there with a team. And you got me and my team, a group of non-technical, non-engineering, <laughs> a group of HBCU thinkers. Because HBCU thought is the thought that America misses a lot of the times because it's, it's the innovation you never heard of because you don't look at it. And I'm proud to say that on a project uh, based on we have to solve a problem about waste and compost. I mean, yeah, we had some engineers create apps. They had all the digital tech and da 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 But we had the showmanship and we had the greatest idea. And I'm proud to say that we came in second, that non-engineers beat out engineers. And that's the type of innovation. And I, when I was there, I spoke highly on my HBCU because that is the innovation that an HBCUs produce. It's a thought that you've never heard of, never seen, and it's different, and it's untapped. So that was a very humbling moment. And to be invited to come back again the next year, uh, it was amazing, and it gets, it's getting bigger. And now I 
have brought in people from my school. Now, I have told young people, hey, next year when I apply, you're applying too because we need you in those spaces. It's not even about having a seat at the table. Let's get in the room. Mm. I'm not concerned about seats because a seat does not determine or establish that you'll actually do well or you'll keep. Mm. But we can get in that room and shake that room out on foot. And I'm fine with that. So I plan to bring my tribe, a bigger tribe this upcoming year. But I'm blessed to be, um, to have went twice. And I'm blessed to be a member of the Forbes 30 Under 30, um, Forbes the Culture, because that's the Black collective in there. And we made a space. That's what Black students made in that space. We made a space for ourselves, as we always do. So I'm proud to represent. And I'd like to come in the Forbes, the thank you for sharing that. I'd like to come in the Forbes, the culture group too. Um, as an attendee at the conference last year, they actually, they've only been in existence for about two or three years. And last year they had a sizable influence in that conference with the programming and hosting different events and speaking. Um, and it just reaffirmed for me the influence and the network of African-American people who are doing great things across industries. So thank you for answering that. Um, for those who have just joined, we're here with uh, international education and HBCU activist, Shanady Nwakfor, um, based out of Baltimore, Maryland. And if you have any comments or questions, please feel free to drop them in the thread below. So my next question to you is um, more about the U.S.-China Leadership Project Pengyo conference. Um, uh, at, you were a fellow in that program at Harvard University. Uh, what did you all do and how has it impacted your life and the work that you do? Oh my God, let me, let me just take a slight sip of this uh, Zinfandel before I answer that. <laughs> <laughs> By far, that was the greatest thing that I've ever done in my life. And I don't mm -hmm. think the Golden Bridges and the folks at Project Punk you know, understands what that means as a Nigerian man to be in that space. Harvard is the, it's the epitome of education, the epitome of, mm -hmm. of high school, of, 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 of learning. So to be invited to come there, and I, I have to tell people this, over 10,000 people applied and about 100 got in. And I was one of those 100s. I thought back to elementary school when I was bad, when teachers told me that I wouldn't even make it to college. Mm. And I'm like, jokes on you, I made it to Harvard. So it was a moment, and I had to make sure that I represented more than anything else, not for me, not for my dad, for the HBCU, because it's the HBCU that got me there, and it's important to never forget that. That experience was amazing, uh, being on the Harvard's campus. And, you know, I'll be honest, feeling intimidated at first, I'm like, I did say to myself when I was there in my hotel room, I said, are you sure you're Harvard's material? Can you compete? These are some professionals from across the country. These are some Chinese students who know China from the back of their hand, from firsthand experience. What does a black boy raised in Washington, D.C. know about international relations? But again, thanks to the HBCU, I know about rela relatability politics. I know about how to take one thing and compare it to another to mesh an idea. I know about interconnectedness. To my surprise, upon my arrival there, and I'm not here to toot my own horn, I brought a uniqueness that they've never seen before. I made sure that even though I was in this different space, that I was not going to compromise my blackness nor my Africanness. So the entire time I was there, I was in tribal attire. And for me, I know at an HBCU where I'm allowed to think as freely as possible, I knew that I had to mix um, diplomacy with a little bit of finesse and a little bit of pop culture. So we had an assignment where we had to create programs that we can bring back to our schools that um, could promote China-US dialogue. So me personally, type A personality, extrovert, ENFJ, Donald Myers-Briggs. I don't like to be bored during presentations, and I'm sure as hell not going to bore myself. So what I did was all of the programs that I created, I named them after rap songs. 
Now, it made people laugh, which was part of, you know, I'm a communications major, so I knew what I was doing there. That's called agenda. So, <laughs> but I noticed that at the end of the program, my ideas were the only ones everybody remembered. And that was the mm -hmm. point. So I was able to go there and use those skills that I learned at the HBCU to educate at, at Harvard. Like, who would have thunk? I had amazing times uh, discussing with um, um, Graham Allison. He is a teacher of history in the School of History Policy, I think. And, and we talked about Africa-China interactions. We see what's going on right now with Africa-China relations, with what's going on in um, Guangzhou and the Africans whose passports were taken. We talked about that three, four years ago. And he talked about his concept of Thucydides' trap. And we were able to discuss that. We dialogued. He signed his book for me. And we've kept in contact, as well as the, um, the Fairbanks Center there. I've actually gone to visit twice. My mentor uh, works there. And I, 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 this is all through that program. I've been able to keep up. Um, even though I've stopped the program two, three years ago, these people are still interacting with me. Whenever I'm in Boston, he makes time for me to meet him at the Fairbanks Center. And we discuss. And that cultural connection, it can never stop. And that was the benefit of that Project Pung Yu program. And I was able, as a black man, to educate uh, my Chinese counterparts on what it's really like being a black person in America. And it was important, it was imperative that I made sure that they saw the importance of the black struggle because once you understand the black struggle, you'll look at black people differently. You'll treat black people differently. And more importantly, you'll understand black people from a, a, a better lens rather than a skewed one. And I thought that was my job there. And I got that done and I'm proud to have been a representative of not only Morgan State University, but of HBCUs around the country. Thank you for sharing that. I wanted to give a quick shout out. I see some of our uh, past speakers on, uh, Byron L. Williams and DeAndre, so I'm just giving a quick shout out. Um, so on these things, you've been in places that could be considered, you know, very high level or of a particular echelon. And my question is, how does someone uh, deal with imposter syndrome in those spaces, feeling that you deserve to be there, that you have the right to be there. Do you have any guidance or advice uh, for those who may be feeling um, nervous or intimidated to enter certain spaces? I will say this. Um, what humbles me is no matter how high I go, I am not God. So no matter how high I rise in this world, in my view, there is a higher place that I can never reach. So that reminds me to humble myself. Keep my eyes to the, uh, keep my eyes fixed on the program and keep my eyes, my feet on the ground. Um, the best thing to uh, avoid imposter syndrome is even if you're a president, let's say you're a president, let's say you're a delegation, you know, I, I always tell people, I lead through servitude. I am a servant. You may call me leader, king, whatever you, these are just all random examples, but I will always represent myself as a servant. And I do that so I don't get too engrossed within myself. Because what then happens is that I'll forget my creator and say, shoot, I brought me here. It's not like that. I don't, I don't want to get lost in the worldly things that are presented. So I, I do my best to remind myself that you're a servant. No matter what, when you're here, you are here to serve. It's not about you. It's not about me. And I always say this. It's not about me. It's about the collective we. I am just a delegate of people. So I'm serving them. I'm not letting them down. So that's what I remind people to do because I have run into a couple of people that, um, that felt like they were, you know, that they were on top of the world and that they were, you know, the greatest gift uh, that God could give. And I had to remind them and remind them that at in any instant, you can be humbled spiritually <laughs> before you're humbled physically. <laughs> don't forget, uh, uh, that we, we serve a, a higher God, a higher kingdom. That's just how I was raised. And my father is a great example because my father is a servant leader. He is the dean of graduate school, of graduate studies, excuse me, at Bowie State University, another HBCU. He's been there since I was born. So that's about 27 years. And when my dad was an adjunct, 
an adjunct in an office with no window. Might as well call it a glorified janitor's closet. He served. Up until the point he became a full professor, he served. Assistant Dean of Arts and Science, he served. Dean of Arts and Science, he served. Up until the point where he is right now, Dean of Graduate School, he served. And he's always taught us that you are never too great to serve. So that's how I avoid imposter syndrome. That's what I would tell other people. Don't forget what you are here to do, what you are called to do. You're here to do a calling. It's not about you. You are <laughs> just you are just a piece of the puzzle, a voice of the vessel. Mm. <laughs> By the way, I'm a poet. I don't know if you know. <laughs> to that, thank you so much, Shanaydu. Um, for giving that very personal perspective. So my next question, I see that uh, Byron L. Williams is on, mentioned that he has two young sons watching. Hey, hey to, to uh, two Byron Juniors. Uh, <laughs> and, I, and I realize there may also be folks on the call or who may, this may reach, who don't have a background or don't know what HBCUs are or what the value is. So maybe you could share a little bit about what is an HBCU, what do they stand for, the, you know, not too deep of a history, but a little bit of the history and mainly the values um, of attending an HBCU and the strengths of, of attending those institutions. I'm going to give you a very funny example. In 1992, at the Grammys, rap music was not allowed as a category in that space, white space, if you will. And folks like Tupac, Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre, and NWA, they, they weren't standing for it. So they went and did their own thing. They had their own party. They awarded themselves. They saw themselves. They granted themselves the greatness that the Grammys wouldn't get them. Long story short, those times have changed, right? Mm -hmm. HBCU has a similar thing. It's black people doing for themselves, not waiting for white people to acknowledge them. A lot of these land grant universities, a lot of these institutions where black people wanted to educate themselves. A lot of schools like Morgan State University, uh, originally Centenary Biblical Institute, um, 1867. A lot of these schools wanted to teach black men to be ministers, wanted to give black men, soon to be freed black slaves or free black slaves, a chance at life. And the reason why the HBCU is the most important success story is, let's look at statistics. Statistically, the HBCU should have failed. Statistically, the HBCU should have never made it. Statistically, we started our schools in barns in fields, an entire university sometimes was being ran in one small building. But we've been able to produce some of the greatest people like Robert F. Smith or rest his soul, Earl G. Graves. So it is the opportunity to be an alchemist. And that's what the HBCU is. It's alchemy. It's able to take anything and find its greater good that society may not see and transform it into something positive. And the funny thing is, even though it's a historically black college, it can do it to any race, any gender, any type of person that walks into school. You can't get that anywhere else. And it does it at the fraction of the price. Mm. So that is the history of the HBCU, in my opinion, in a nutshell, without going too deep. If y'all want to know more, okay. uh, <laughs> y'all hit me up. We can talk. We can chat. <laughs> but also the community aspect the social aspect being around individuals i'm a uh, uh, graduate of morgan state university for a uh, a master's degree and spent some time there at undergrad before going overseas for my degree but um just the identity and individual feeling feeling um um a part of truly feeling a part of a community being taught by people who look like me and learning things that are you know related to me whether it's black history in classes or like other things that i um didn't see happening at predominantly white institutions that i've attended so i will say that that's a unique experience um in my opinion that every black person and black student should have uh, i know that might be a big ass but i'm gonna say it anyway Ooh. um 
So, uh, and for the folks who are here listening, uh, who recently have joined, we're here with uh, Chinedi Nuwakfor, who is a uh, international education and HBCU activist, uh, currently based out of Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, so feel free to uh, put your comments and your questions in the thread below. So the next question, Chinedi, may be a little personal, but I think that there's a lot of value in it because it's a question that you particularly can answer. Um, on, and because I know you and I know your journey <laughs> on it. Before you ask, I, I got to be true to myself. I wanted to refill my elixir real quick. Okay. You know? <laughs> 10 seconds, please. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Alice. And I'd like to say to everybody who's on, thank you so much for joining and, and uh, being here to uh, support our BPIA chats and speaker series. It's our hope that uh, you all are gaining new information and insights in a variety of different industry and field areas, as well as experiences of those who are African-American and of those in the diaspora. So Chinedu, now that you're back, um, because I know you and I know your journey, uh, some folks may experience um, being told that, so for example, a little bit earlier, you mentioned that as a child, your behavior, which may have been exhibiting confidence or leadership or uh, misinterpreted behavior, was perceived as bad or labeled as something else. Um, whereas it being tunneled in the right way could lead to someone being as great as you are, right? So I'm curious if you have any advice or suggestions specifically for students who, or young people who may have been labeled a certain kind of way or who may have been identified or as a certain way or told because they come from a certain place or a certain background that they can't pursue certain things that an international career isn't for them, that it, being a diplomat, that, that you may have some guidance or some encouragement for those students, particularly young men and young black men <clears throat> in the U.S. and around the world. In the words of a famous black gospel song, why should I feel discouraged? Mm. I, I think black parents need to listen to Maya Angelou's quote differently. The one that says, when someone shows you their true colors, believe them. See, but the thing is, we look at colors and paint them in the way that we believe and not the way that they express themselves. So in elementary school, my behavior was perceived as um, being disobedient, insubordinate, because that was the color that the education system wanted to see. Mm. They paid attention. They would know that I was unique, that I was enterprising, and that I wasn't being challenged. Black people have to be very careful because we live in a world where once our children think outside of the box, a box that, that, that spiritually they're bigger than, they're labeled as noisemakers. They're labeled as people who are starting trouble. And you want to eliminate those people or remove those people so they don't spoil the bunch. You want to call them a, a, a bad apple, you know, which I always find interesting when people say things like bad apples. But do sour grapes not make wine? Um, that's going to go over some people's heads. But... <laughs> The, the point that I, I mean in that is you have to know how to cultivate your people. Um, personally, if I'm being very personal, I can't wait to have kids because I know my kids are going to be just as crazy and disobedient. <laughs> as I'm going to know what to do with them. Um, when I was in school, because of the way I spoke, and more importantly, wasn't about what I said, is that I had influence. No one cares of somebody who talks up and speaks up. People do it all the time. They only care if you can influence. And my, all of the school systems that I were a part of were not interested in me influencing students because I could influence them better than the teachers. And it wasn't really to get in trouble. It was to know the power of self, to know the power of the people, which I haven't changed. Like, I have suspensions from first grade, from me standing up, telling them that there's more of us than them. Right? And <laughs> That was back in 1999, and what, almost 21 years later, 
dealing with COVID-19 and how the government is treating its people, was I not right? There's more. See, that's the thing. When, when, it's funny, when you get older, someone will now qualify your statement as being self-evident. Mm. But when I was younger, it was dismissed as being insubordinate and disruptive and let's put them on medication, let's get them out of the group and da 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 all these other things. I would tell parents, nurture the, listen, if you believe in the power that gave you that child, nurture that child. Because remember, that child does not belong to you. That child belongs to God. It is your job to raise that child, to make sure that that child is, is ready to take on the skills that God has presented for the child. So, because there may come a day that, that what could be considered a disruption mm. in the classroom is a necessary disruption in a social or international space, if you get what I'm, if oh, you I, can make, speak on that a little bit more. Absolutely. And from the international space of it all, it's, it's those ideas to be, to question that have led me to go into, see now, Dealing with that, I'm not scared to go into difficult spaces and talk about China-U.S. relations because that's a touchy area. A lot of people don't want to speak on that. But it was that fearlessness. See, if I didn't have that, I would be in the corner. Uh, diplomacy doesn't come from being scared or sitting with my hands folded on my laps. You have to actually be bold to step up in the face of an adversary, of a foe, or of a friend and say, hey, I'm challenging you. And I think that is where I've gotten a lot of my success in because the greatest feature about me is I'm fearless in regard regardless of what I'm doing. So that at least helps me to get into a room and to know how to speak, to go into the State Department and say, actually, I don't agree with you. I want to challenge your thought based on these historical facts. And I think that's what we need more of, uh, people in the world who are fearless. And parents, I will say it again, like, allow your kids to speak because uh, <laughs> there is a... Uh, I know you went to school in Italy. There's an Italian quote um, from Pope John Paul II, Vox Populi, Vox Dei. The voice of the people is the voice of God. So if your kids are speaking, you need to nurture that. You need to, to let them fulfill their destiny, not yours. Mm. Thank you for that. So I wanted to ask quickly before we wrap up, um, I know that, and it's in relation to one of the last points that you said about being fearless and going into spaces, for example, where you may not necessarily um, agree with the leadership or the individual that you're speaking to. And um, I know that you've been pretty closely connected with the White House initiative for, uh, for HBCUs, including going to meet and, and share HBCU initiatives with uh, uh, the current Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVoe. So could you share a little bit about um, perspectives that you may have on criticisms from individuals that may say, how can you meet or discuss with someone that may have a very different view than you have on topics that are oh, important to you? There we go. I'm glad you, I'm glad you asked that. Um, I'm here to do the work. I don't care who I'm working with. I'm here to do the work. The work means more than my personal opinion. Um, remember, at the, I'm very religious, or at least spiritual. At the Last Supper, Jesus sat with two people that betrayed him, Judas and Peter. And by, in, in accordance to the scriptures, Peter became the first pope. What do I mean when I say that is, I don't care about your dissension or how we may agree or disagree. What I care about is are we getting the work done? I'm ready to walk, work across the aisle. I'm an independent, okay? I may lean more Democratic, Democratic, but there are Republican uh, uh, clauses and ideas that I do like. And when you think about it, the problems of the world are not partisan. <laughs> They're people-based. So I work with people. We have to be willing to work with all people, no matter who they are. And in my experience, I'm grateful uh, for Secretary DeVoe, uh, not only allowing, um, you know, Dr. Mack and, you know, uh, Jonathan Holyfield, who you know, leads the eight, um, White House Initiative, to have the conference, but for inviting certain student leaders back after the conference. She didn't have to do that. You know what I saw in that moment when she invited us back? That regardless if we agree or disagree, she wants to dialogue. That matters to me the most. 
I don't care about your personal opinion. We're here to get work done. And I think people have to remember that we need all. The Lord says, build the house, build the house of the Lord. He didn't say what materials to use, and he didn't say what people to use. <laughs> but we're building the house. Um, whether the front is going to differ from the back, for as long as we build that house, it will have uh, access for all to come in. So I'm willing to work with anybody. I'm willing to work with Betsy DeVoe. I was willing to listen to President Donald Trump because if I am to become a great leader tomorrow, I have to know what every side says. You just can't. I mean, the truth of the matter is, if McDonald's is just worried about McDonald's, they won't see Chick fil A undercutting them on the left or Chipotle undercutting them on the right. You have to, this is a race, it's a marathon. You have to look at all your opponents, their strengths and their weaknesses, and be willing to work not only with them in the race, but to work to get your agenda passed, to work to get your bills moved, to work to get your, that's what I have learned from people like Nancy Pelosi with this CARES Act that just gave everybody their stimulus yesterday. You have to, you weren't getting that passed if you didn't work with your colleagues. So I have to tell a lot of people, a lot of people, they did say, I can't believe you are willing to work with her and I can't believe you're willing to da 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 and this and that. And I like to, I'm a, I'm a stat, statistician guy. I like to go to statistics. <laughs> Have you all forgotten who Martin Luther King worked with? Hmm. The reason why he's a great man, and even though all of his ideologies I don't believe with, he knew that he could not do it alone. He knew that he needed the left and the right to make sense in the center. And I think that's what people miss. I'm looking for the equilibrium. I'm looking for the middle ground. And I will have to go to both sides so I can be able to make a conscious thought because sometimes the side that you side with is not always completely right. Mm. That's just the truth of it all. So you have to be willing to look at all sides of the thing to be able to come up with your conscious decision. And absolutely, I will meet with Betsy DeVoe and work with her team in the Department of Education to create better access for these HBCs. Because you know what? If you look at it like this, there is no time to waste. Time waits for no man. So if mm -hmm. you're going to wait for your candidate to be in office, then you're letting down those students at the HBCUs. Remember, you're mm -hmm. a servant. You're not here to make choices. You're here to serve. Serve. And give service to those who you are servicing. That will go over some people's head as well. Mm. <laughs> Thank you for that. I appreciate those perspectives. Um, and what I'll add is sometimes... For me, when I enter spaces with different leaders or different um, industry area individuals, I enter that space real with the realization and the reality that you as an individual, for example, Chinedu, you may have been a catalyst to that one per For all we know, as an individual, we may be the first person that this per that this other individual has encountered. You are now not only representing yourself, you're representing an, ag an agency, an organization, uh, a university, HBCUs in that way. Um, and just for me, the idea that, you know, if that was a bad conversation, you know, that that may have, could easily reflect poorly on HBCUs and then have an effect. So by utilizing that opportunity to, um, you know, push forward the good and positive work of HBCUs, I really commend you for that. And if so, I could just put this little tidbit in there real quick. Mm -hmm. in our, for the culture, in our culture, everybody's talking about the seat at the table. Again, the question is not the seat at the table, but to get the seat at the table, you have to know where the venue of the dinner is. <laughs> I'm trying to get in the venue, not just the table. I need to be in the venue. <laughs> Thank you for that. So as we're coming up on 3 p.m., I'll go ahead and uh, give you one last opportunity to share any concluding thoughts um, or ending comments that you have. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to thank the um, Black Professionals in International Affairs for affording me such an opportunity to share my expertise. And I look forward in the future, during and after this Rona, to have more of these discussions and fireside chats and programs. Um, what I would like to say to everybody, especially the gentleman who said he's watching with his two sons, um, I'm no different from anybody else. I'm no, I'm no more significant than any of my peers. I, I think 
what makes me unique is that I lean into the blessings that God has already coded my body to receive. Hmm. I don't lean back. I don't fall back. I lean in. Even when it gets difficult, I lean further in. So I would offer everybody in this time to lean into your blessing, lean into your destiny, lean into your self-worth, um, and keep your options open, um, your mind open, your spirit open, and diversify that portfolio. Um, my degree is in communications, and now my master's about to be in project management. By my degrees, they have nothing to do with international uh, relations, but it doesn't mean I don't want to master that. Um, be able to master different fields because then you become indispensable for talks, for conferences, and for positions. Don't limit yourself. Um, and lastly, uh, but never the least, I would like to leave you all with a quote uh, that comes from my people in my homeland in Nigeria. <clears throat> and it's a quote that you'll know when I translate it, but it says, Oshishi parako simuru toya. And that simply means the way you make your bed, so you shall lie on it. I know that I want to sleep soundly and calmly. So I'm making my bed so it can be comfortable for me and those who come after me.